Which anti-federalist tried to stop the Constitution from being ratified, only to go on and be Vice President of the United States? Hi Founder fans, Jason here, and today we'll be discussing George Clinton. Now, we're not talking about the funk musician George Clinton, though if you are going to throw a dance party, you might want to put a Parliament song in there. Who we're talking about is George Clinton, who was born and lived in the 18th century. George Clinton was from a moderately wealthy New York family, and he went and fought in the French and Indian War before finishing his education and becoming a lawyer. And from there, he essentially started his political career at the bottom. He was a county clerk for the local court of common pleas. And then he made his way up and eventually was elected to the Colonial Assembly. Now, this just happened to be about when revolution was breaking out, and George Clinton was sent to the Continental Congress. He was there briefly at the beginning of 1776, and although he did support independence, he left before the vote and on and signing of the Declaration of Independence and returned to New York, where he was shortly elected the first governor in the history of the state of New York. And he held this position for the next 18 years, and becoming the longest serving governor of New York in its history, despite being the first. So during this time, of course, the war was going on, and George Clinton became very close with George Washington, as New York was a very important state. There were, uh, it was right in the middle of the colonies. Uh, the Hudson River was always a target of the British. And I'll remind you, for seven of the eight years of the American Revolution, the British were occupying New York City. And actually, once they left and evacuated, when George Washington triumphantly made his way into New York onto Manhattan Island, well, George Clinton was one of several people who joined him because this was his state and he was fighting for it too. And he was, at the time, under the Articles of Confederation, the highest ranking official when it came to New York State. So they went in, you know, they had dinner together, everything was honky-dory, and several years go by. Again, Clinton continues to be governor, and when the Constitution is written and sent to the states for ratification, well, New York was uh, the tightest of races. And I'll remind you that this was a time where the capital was essentially New York City. That's where the Continental Congress kind of found itself and stayed. It was a nice middle middle ground, and it was a growing city. It was New York was not the biggest state, the most populated, or the wealthiest state by any means. Uh, it would be Virginia, and to a degree Pennsylvania, and even Massachusetts had more people and more wealth. But you could tell New York City was starting to blow up, if you will. It was a better port, uh, there was a lot of immigration coming in, and, and things were going very, very well. So, New York State was on the fence about whether or not to accept this constitution even to the point where the Federalist Papers that famously promoted the Constitution were written by James Madison and Alexander Hamilton and a few by John Jay in New York State, and almost all of them are addressed to the people of New York because they really needed to convince New York to join the Union, this growing state with this new growing city right in the center of this new country. Now, interestingly, George Clinton was an anti-federalist. He was very much against the Constitution. Now, granted, part of that was probably that he was essentially the president of New York, and he probably wanted to hold on to that power. So, there was an anti-federalist writer whose pen name was Cato. Historians generally agree that Cato, although we're not 100% certain who the author was, Historians generally agree that George Clinton, the governor of New York, was the one writing some of the most important anti-federalist articles. So much so that many times Cato was specifically addressed by Alexander Hamilton in some of the federalist papers. And a lot of Hamilton's argument is, well, you say that the new president of the United States is too powerful. He actually has less power over the people than George Clinton. He doesn't say that outright. He says the governor of New York, but he's pointing at George Clinton. Now, despite his best efforts, uh, George Clinton lost that battle and the Constitution was ratified and came into power. A few years go by and actually Clinton's elected out of office. He's replaced by John Jay, who, who gave up just to, just to demonstrate how powerful the position of governor of New York was. John Jay was the first chief justice of the United States Supreme Court, and he quit that job when he was elected governor of New York. A few more years go by, and what do you know? The people uh, don't necessarily love John Jay. 
and they go back to George Clinton, who spends about six more years as governor of New York. He leaves this position only when he's asked by Thomas Jefferson to run as vice president of the United States. Now, this is extremely interesting because this is for Jefferson's second term. I'll remind you that his first term, he ran with vice presidential candidate Aaron Burr. And for the first several elections in United States history, every elector cast two votes for two different people. Whoever got the most votes was president, and whoever got the second most votes was vice president. This led to, well, for George Washington, John Adams became vice president twice. But then, Adams and Jefferson, who were against each other, well, Jefferson became John Adams' vice president. And after that, Aaron Burr tied with Jefferson and almost, even though everyone knew he was supposed to be vice president, almost ended up taking over and becoming president. Now, they made this change that we are used to today where you make basically one vote for your party. They run on a ticket and you vote for the president with his vice president to be vice president. And this, the first time it was done for the fifth presidential election, George Clinton was Thomas Jefferson's vice president. But I should note that in the first four elections where anyone just voted for whoever they wanted, George Clinton received votes in those first four elections to be vice president, technically to be president, but essentially vice presidential votes. Then for the fifth election, he was voted to be Thomas Jefferson's vice president. And then when James Madison ran for president, who did he ask to be his vice president? George Clinton. So George Clinton was received vice presidential votes in the first six United States presidential elections. By far the most of any human being in American history. Now, I, I want to say unfortunately, but he had aged a lot over the decades we've just discussed, and he did pass away while he was vice president for uh, James Madison. So I do want to point out one more thing, because you might have thought, well, if he was Thomas Jefferson's vice president, why would he then be vice president again for someone else? Shouldn't the vice president have ran for president? Great question. Thanks. Uh, at the time, it was seemed more like the, the secretary of state was the position that generally ran to replace a retiring president from within the same party. And this was mostly done because the Secretary of State not only oversees foreign affairs, but they also oversaw domestic tranquility. So if you were Secretary of State, it seemed, in, in actuality, I should say, the Secretary of State would have more knowing, he'd be more involved with both foreign and domestic policy than the Vice President, who essentially just sat in Congress uh, sat, as the, the Vice President is the President of the United States Senate. So the vice president would just sit there and make sure everyone was playing nice and vote to break ties. Meanwhile, the secretary of state is out there doing presidential stuff <laughs> to a lower degree. So, uh, and I will say, uh, Thomas Jefferson was secretary of state. He became president. His secretary of state, James Madison, became president. His secretary of state, James Monroe, became president. His secretary of state, John Quincy Adams, became president. And that's when there was the big argument between uh, Andrew Jackson and uh, John Adams, because there were four people running for president in, in uh, the 1824 uh, election, I believe. Uh, four people running for president, and John Quincy Adams made a corrupt bargain with Henry Clay to cast his support behind John Quincy Adams to beat Andrew Jackson. And th the bargain was that he would then name Henry Clay as Secretary of State. Because if you were Secretary of State for the last 25 years, that meant you would be president next. Granted, that's not how it worked out. Andrew Jackson made a big thing about a corrupt bargain, and that really worked in his favor. But uh, back to George Clinton. Uh, George Clinton, uh, James Madison was going to be the next president. That's why he was Secretary of State in the first place, more or less. Uh, and George Clinton seemed happy being the vice president and keeping the Senate under control, considering he didn't think it was a good idea in the first place. So that's the story in very brief of George Clinton, uh, governor of New York and vice president of the United States. One, two, three, fourth vice president of the United States. So I really hope you enjoyed that. Uh, I am going to put a link below to a book called uh, George Clinton, Master Builder of the Empire State. Uh, there are several biographies of George Clinton, 
I really enjoyed this one. I, I realized as I was starting, it's not on my shelf behind me, so I can't show you, but I think you might appreciate it. So I'll put it in the link below. Please hit like. I really appreciate that. And please subscribe if you're new here. I put out videos about more obscure founders five days a week. I usually keep them to five or six minutes. This one ran a little bit long because George Clinton is an amazing character and has so many curious uh, bits and pieces to the American Revolution that I so much enjoy and I hope you enjoyed it too. So thank you for watching uh, and I will see you with another founder tomorrow.